Good morning, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to Blue Ball for our service this morning. Let's begin singing in the church hymnal with song number 24. (laughs) Give God immortal praise, number 24 in the church hymnal. Do so give to our God immortal praise, mercy. For the second song, number 141. Crown him with many crowns. Number 141. (coughs) Do crown him with many crowns. Fair flower 
But praise shall never fail throughout eternity. Did you think about what we sang during that last phrase of the song? Beautiful. Thank you, Brett, for those songs. Good morning and welcome to Blue Ball Sunday School Hour this morning. Um, I did put a book or a box to collect the old Sunday school books. We're entering into a new quarter here. So there's a box down there by the offering table. And uh, as I look at our new Sunday school quarterlies, I'm not sure if everybody got one or not, but if you look at that book, I had to think about the non-resistance and wisdom literature. And the picture on the bottom is a crown and a nail. You know, the, the non-resistant part of that and what Jesus went through for all of us, I can only imagine the non-resistance war he might have been fighting at that point. There had to be a lot of wanting not to go through that, but he knew that he was going to do whatever it took to please God the Father. And with, with that in mind, God did give him all power. He had power to walk away from that. But by going through everything he did, he proved his obedience to the Father. And at the same time, through all of that, he proved his love for humanity by following through with the whole plan of salvation um, for the Father. When you think of that, sometimes it's kind of hard to imagine everything in there that was going on. The very humans that he had helped create now turned against him, and he knew, he knew what was coming. At least the majority of them, the rulers and the authorities had turned against him totally, not all of them. So as we look into our new uh, Sunday school lesson, it's taken out of Ecclesiastes, and, and Ecclesiastes is full of the meaningless or the vanity, vanity, meaningless. And there's one thing for certain that is not meaning, meaningless or vanity, and that is if we are living for Christ, we keep in mind what he has done for us and we're living for him, it is anything but meaningless or vanity. And, um, and what Solomon was kind of focused on is the world around us. Some people talk about like your vertical and your horizontal relationships, okay? He was thinking about the, the horizontal and we need to keep our focus on the vertical. And that's where I'm gonna get into for devotions this morning. Turn with me to Colossians 3. And uh, Paul writes this. Our, our lesson, our Sunday school lesson this morning is life under the sun. And in Colossians 3 here, uh, Paul is giving us examples and writing about kind of life above the sun. Focus above, not under the sun, but keep your focus up there. My Bible heading says uh, what Christians should do there in the beginning of chapter 1. And NIV says living as those made alive in Christ. So if we're going to do that, if we're gonna, we believe that Jesus died for all of us. If we're going to make um, that our, our Christian priority, not to focus on the horizontal, but keep our focus more on the vertical. And uh, Solomon, like, you know, like I said, he was worldly desired. It was, his whole thing was looking at the, at the uh, horizontals and not the verticals. <clears throat> Paul here, in the first couple of verses, he is encouraging the Christians to set their focus above, set their focus above. And I think of the song that Brett chose this morning, Repeat his mercies in your song. If we have that focus continually, it's definitely going to help us as we go through our days. Um, verse 1 in Colossians 3 says, If ye then be risen in Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid in Christ. So here we see an example, or Paul is talking about, um, if we believe, and we're coming into the Easter, the spring, you know, we believe that Jesus crucified, rose, buried, rose from the dead, ascended, and all of that. We believe that. We have our affections set on that. Set your affections on it. Focus on that, not on the earthly things like we're, like we're going to see in our, our lesson today. We know that Christ uh, went to the Father to be with him, and... Um, it's so easy, maybe not for you guys, it's so easy to be distracted by earthly things. And we gotta get that focus right all the time. And it's definitely gonna help get the distractions that we have down here in, in line a lot more. We have to put off the old, basically is what he's saying here. Put off the old and put on the new life for Jesus Christ now. 
put on that new life for Jesus Christ now. So as we live that life, let's live it for him. Verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And I had to think about that a little bit, where in Thessalonians, uh, Paul talks about the Lord himself. He's coming back, and we know that Christ is going to come back. He's going to come back with a shout of an archangel. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be something that everybody on earth is going to recognize that things are happening. He's going to come back with a shout. He's going to come back with a trump of God. And it says those who are dead in Christ shall rise first, those who have gone before us. And then we shall, those who are alive are going to meet him in the air. And I had to think, man, that's going to be an awesome day when that happens. There's going to be excitement. There's going to be a lot of things happening. All the problems of this world are going to be over. You know, everything, it's, it's done. And um, when, when we think of that and everything happening in our world today, you ever really think, maybe there's a chance we're going to be of the people that are alive. We're not going to be the ones that are buried. We're going to be alive when, when Christ returns. There's a chance that we'll see that day. It's exciting. Verse 5, 6, and 7 there, he says, uh, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscences, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Not often does, is the word mortified used here, but the meaning of that is basically we should consider ourselves dead or unresponsive. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, we should consider ourselves dead and unresponsive to all the desires in the world, but we know how temptations work, and uh, sometimes that's hard to, uh, to overcome, but it's doable. And the impurities, the lustful desires, materialisms, and all of that, he's saying this is why, or because of all of these things, the wrath of God is going to be poured out onto the children or onto everybody who continues to live in them, who doesn't want to change their lives and live for him. And let's face it, every single person who's ever walked on the earth besides Jesus has lived in sinful desires, sinful states, and has been there on the wrong side of things. Um, nobody's above that. We, we all make mistakes, and we all need to come to that and realize that... Uh, that uh, it's only by the blood of Christ, by the grace of God, that we can rise above those things by the help of God. So as we look at Ecclesiastes in the Sunday school, this is the next three lessons, I guess it is, um, when the things of this world seem so meaningless, let's keep our focus on the vertical, on Jesus, to help us not be distracted by all the things that this world has to offer for us. And I had to also think of, uh, oh, if I can get that together right now, I don't want to gain the whole world and lose my own soul, where there are so many things that can distract us. We're just so tied up, but it's never worth it. So just keep the focus above and, and not below. With those thoughts, let's pause for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning again. Thank you for your word again. Thank you, Lord, that um, Paul has jotted all these things down for us that we can learn and grow by that. And Use his examples to be drawn closer to you. And Father, I just thank you for um, our Sunday school time that we can learn to uh, dig into the word and, and the meanings of all these things that uh, we can always be drawn closer to you, that we can have a closer walk with you in all these ways. Father, I pray this morning that you bless each one of the teachers as they prepared, and also I pray that you be with uh, Brother Michael as he shares in the later message that uh, all of us would be enthused and uh, refueled again for another week. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's offering is for the Mennonite Air Mission, and next Sunday is the Mission Fund. So at this time, I'll dismiss um, Sunday school classes, kindergarten to the back, primary one and two to the front. And the youth out the back. Intermediate to the front. And the adults are dismissed.
any time the front room ain't full, somebody just jump in and help fill it. Basically 10 people. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the introduction. I thought Steve did really well. I'd like us to uh, look at this lesson and examine ourselves. If we see the negative side, if we hear seeing Solomon going on and talking about vanity of vanities and vexation of spirit, and it just seems like, wow, that man just had an <laughs> unmeaningful life. And uh, Steve, uh, Steve uh, mentioned that that's not true, and we recognize we're in the New Testament era. We're part of another kingdom, and our focus needs to be beyond the sun. His focus was under the sun, life under the sun. He says, well, what does it profit a man in all his labor which he taketh under the sun? So he looks, he's looking at things horizontally, and it seems very negative. So uh, we could spend a lot of time on focusing on the positive side, but we're, this lesson is, doesn't have a whole lot of that. So as we look on the negative, we'll talk a little bit about the positive, but sometimes I think we don't look enough to see how that is, to examine ourselves to really, am I on that side? Am I looking around the horizontal too much and losing my peace and not having a godly, Christ-centered, uh, two-kingdom principle focus, or am I having a focus of this is, wow, this is, whole world's going to hell, uh, and this type thing, and this, everything is just meaningless. <clears throat> and so I think as we look at this lesson, uh, we're starting a new quarter of uh, non-resistant and wisdom li literature. We're going to be talking about a way of life. Non-resistance is not something, not just going to war. Non-resistance is a way of life. And so as we talk about <clears throat> a way of life, we're going to get into Luke and see Jesus' way of life right around Easter time. I like the way they work that in in our Sunday school quarterlies that they get one of the gospel writers to, for us to study about the life of Christ. And it really was a life of non-resistance. I mean, he could have called 10,000 angels, and more than 10,000 angels. He could have said, but then we wouldn't be where we're at today. So um, as we look at this introduction to this uh, wisdom, literature, non-resistance, <clears throat> see that the first three lessons are from Ecclesiastes, then the last, then the fourth is from Solomon, Song of Solomon, and then we go into, chat, uh, we go into Luke, study about the Easter message, and then we go on a whole bunch of different books on the topic of non-resistance. And um, you see Solomon here focuses on finding happiness with uh, Life under the sun, early pursuits. And this lesson, we're still in lesson one, and the next, chat, the next lesson talks about how to live life under the sun, which is uh, Solomon later on goes, tells us, and that's in chapter five, and then the next lesson is in chapter 12. So there's a lot in between there, a whole lot in between this lesson, chapter one, to lesson five, and next lesson, next chap uh, chapter five to lesson 12. So there's a whole lot in there in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're just scratching the surface. He talks about there's a time and a season under the sun for everything, and Sol Solomon was said to be the wisest man on all the earth at that time. But it was worldly wisdom. He could have been your science teacher. He could have told you how everything worked. And, you know, I think sometimes we see that, and we get so much worldly knowledge, and then we see how everything works, and then it don't work. We get frustrated. And we start saying, vanity, vanity, everything's vanity. It just don't work. It's just the wind goes to the north, goes to the south, and it goes east and west, and it goes around, and it just goes around, and that's just how life is. But when we have eternal perspective, and we realize 
We got to keep our focus on Jesus. It all changes. So the Bible, uh, the, uh, someone has said, our creator made a God-shaped space in each of us. That space needs to be filled with God and his purpose for us. Did you know you all have a void? And if you have all the wealth, all the wisdom, all the concubines, and everything else, and have your essential life all fulfilled, you can be the most unhappy person. But you have everything, right? No, you don't. There's a spiritual side to you. And that's what brings true joy and purpose. And that God fill, that God size hole, if it's not there, a person can find all kinds of other pursuits. And we see Solomon did that. And this is what our lesson is about. This is how he felt when he left God out of the picture and saw it through all kinds of wives and concubines and learning things, how things work, and all kinds of wisdom and knowledge of how things worked. And he still felt a void. <clears throat> I'm going to read the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to read the introduction here and then open it up for comments. If our faith and conduct never gets above the sun, then life is an exercise of futility. May we live in light of the eternal perspectives. The just shall live by faith. So it's not by things that are around you and, and things working that are around you. It's even though this isn't working, I know God has a plan, and I know he has a future for me in a better place. So it doesn't really matter if things are out of hell or skelter. Is that messed up that way of thinking? No, that's living by faith, believing that that's really God has a plan. Any thoughts? <clears throat> So it's, it's mental and spiritual problem. Yeah. It's not just a mental problem. It is a way of thinking, so it's mental, but it's a spiritual problem. It's a void that only can be filled spiritually. So if we just talk naturally, and that's why I just want to bring this in. I, have believed, I believe there's secular counselors that have helped a lot of people, but people are still left with voids. Secular counselors cannot... They don't bring Christ in the picture, cannot fill that void. Am I against secular counseling? Someone going for your counseling and maybe can get help? No. But it's a whole lot better to have a Christian counselor that can bring Christ in the picture too. And I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on psychology and figuring a person out humanly and getting them to work and functioning out of their dysfunctional state, but they're still dysfunctional. We wonder why. Because we look, put too much emphasis and going to college and learning psychology and figuring human beings out, and we can, and you can, and you can become a good psychologist and figure out how humans work. But there's that void there that if it's not met with spiritual side of things, it's going to be this state where we read, we're going to be reading about very shortly. Vanity, vanity, vexation of spirit. Okay, I work. I now can work. I used to not go to work because I just was depressed. Now I can work, but it's just a, bleh, I don't feel good about it. Well, guess what? In the New Testament, we find out that everything you do if you do it for the Lord, it's great, unless it's sin, which you won't do it for the Lord if it's sin. But, you know, I mean, going to work and, do, and, and uh, whatever you're doing, there's not, you can find joy in that. So it's just a challenge. But we're going to be looking at the negative side here. and It's good to bring a little bit of the positive side in there. Um, I'm going to look at two uh, definitions because we're going to soon get in the word vanity before we get there. And then towards the end, we'll get into vexation of spirit. Vanity is the quality of being worthless and futile, that which is transitory. 
It just goes on. It's just not really. And vexation is a state of being annoyed, frustrated, and worried. Their similar words are irritil- ir- ir- irritable and ex- exasperation. What a state, vexation and vanity. State of being annoyed, frustrated, worried, exasperated, and vanity is a quality of being worthless and futile. So when we think of these words, <laughs> how he felt, I can't imagine. He was one of the wealthiest men, and the Bible says he's the wisest man at that time. And he didn't have any worth and value in his being. So I can have three volunteers to read the text here. <clears throat> Ammon, I'm going to take the next, and Ivan. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to start at the back end and just later on it talks about his wealth too and that that would then bring up, but this first chapter talks about his head knowledge. Did you know you can be a science teacher? And he, verses 5, 6, and 7 pretty well are science statements. <laughs> They're not meant to be scientific statements, but they are. Sun goes up, goes down, the wind goes north and then it does, it goes through the circle and just whirls around. We, and that's, that's how it works. And, the, and then the rivers come. I'm not going to be a science teacher explain, but they go in the ocean. The ocean doesn't keep rising. I mean, all understanding evaporation, clouds, and how all the water comes back around. And um, so he's making statements that he's just seen all this, and nature works that way. And why, why is it? I mean, it just keeps doing a cycle. And, but here we, I'm going to just talk about his wisdom. And verse 18 it says, For in much wisdom is much grief. And he increases knowledge, increases sorrow. And I have seen that today. I've seen that in Einstein and studying about that and remembering those people that just get a lot of head knowledge. This wisdom is talking about earthly wisdom. You know, James talks about two wisdoms, the, the heavenly wisdom is not sensual and devilish, 
the earthly wisdom that just brings a lot of head knowledge and you can figure and you can explain analytically, explain stuff and you don't have the heavenly perspective in it. And this wisdom actually increases sorrow. Let me tell you, if you can listen to the radio program and watch every TV show that explains what's going on around you, you'll have sorrow. That's just all it to it. And you can explain every single bit of everybody's opinion of what's going on, and you can explain what this person said about what his opinion and the other person's view, and you can have that all in your head. You're going to have a lot of sorrow. A lot of sorrow. If that's what you're trying to do by bringing it, and people say this, and I doubt that it's true. Well, you've got to know what's going on around you. Or you just can't live. I've heard that said. I'm not sure that's true. I think sometimes you've got to take your focus off what's going on around you and take your focus heavenward and on Jesus and on the cross. And that's just, but people have a lot of knowledge. I've, heard, I've sat and listened these last days the people, and when I studied as a boy, I remember saying all those people like Einstein, had, they were some of the most unhappy. They didn't have joy. So this wisdom thing here, for in much wisdom, it's not talking about a person learning to know God's will for their life and knowing the Bible and being able to explain Scripture and to be able to explain people eternal perspectives. That's not the wisdom it's talking about. Gain more and more of that and it'll bring you more joy. But this wisdom, this earthly wisdom that James talks about, and he that increases in this knowledge increases sorrow. It's true. It's biblical. It said it, and I'm just emphasizing it and bringing it to our day and age. Brothers and sisters, if you want to have joy, get the heavenly wisdom. There's no sisters here, but yeah, for people that are listening out there. Um, Get the heavenly wisdom. Don't try to have everything figured out. You don't have to. You don't have to know, be able to explain everybody's viewpoint over this world events to find, to really think you have it together. Don't have to figure that out. You don't have to. That's truth. That's opinions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that whole thing with science, we're gonna that's where you gotta understand you cannot agree with some of these when he says there's nothing new under the sun. We know there is, if you understand. But he's talking about nature here and how it works. And it won't change, because God is a God that set it in order, and nature is nature. And it will work that way no matter if men say it's going to change. And people that fall for that are people that are listening to the untruth. <laughs> and nature, and that's just what Solomon's seen. I looked and there's nothing new. The sun comes up, goes down, the wind does this, and, and it could be a whole list added to it. And the rivers go in the ocean, and the ocean just somehow doesn't get fuller, and it just works all out. And he goes through this. And... Um, I just like to read 2 Corinthians 5:17 uh, to that here and it's not true uh, for a Christian it says here therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new and it keeps happening to you every day as you're a Christian that's the exciting part that takes away the whole thing. All things become new. So he's, saying, he's looking at nature and the course of God set things in, and he's just saying, wow, it just goes, and it's just, it's just vanity. What in the world? <laughs> and he's frustrated, and later on he talks about vexation of spirit. And anything that takes us away from the Holy Spirit working in us is a vexation to our spirit. God wants his spirit to come in and take our spirit 
And anything that takes our spirit away from having his spirit commune with our spirit is a vexation. <clears throat> and I'm convinced that's what's happening today when people are listening to voices and trying to gain all the head knowledge and trying to figure out why current events are happening. Does it matter if you have a paternal perspective? Because God knew it. He knows what's going to happen. And he has a place for you prepared. If you have it all figured out, I'm not saying it's a person that likes current events is wrong. I'm just saying if you like current events and it's getting you vexed, probably stop it. <clears throat> so first section there just pretty well uses a word ton, a lot of times, vanity, 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 vanity. And that means worthlessness and futile. And that's how Solomon felt. One of the richest men at that time and one of the wisest. But are the wise, as God said. And he had a bunch of head knowledge. And he says, nothing's worthless. This is worthless. And then we go on and he gives us a science lesson. And he talks one penetration passed away, another comment, but the earth buys forever. Well, we could argue all this stuff. I mean, this is what I'm saying. This is how Solomon looks at it. You know, we could say, well, this isn't, things are new. And, and uh, we could argue the science lessons. He comes on and says, Later on, there is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are come for those that shall come thereafter. We do remember some things, but he's talking about really is, if you do anything great here on earth, eventually you're going to be forgotten about. You know, so why, why are we trying to strive for all these things under the sun? How many of you say spend a lot of time thinking about Solomon and his wealth and his wisdom? He was forgotten about. Only because I brought it up this morning, now we're thinking about it. But you didn't spend a lot of time before. He was forgotten about, basically. Is that because he's written about? And he's in our Bible. We study about him, so we remember. But your, your great things that you do under this sun are really vanity if they're not done for the Lord. So that's the beautiful thing about the purpose of, of a, a Christian that can look beyond what the way Solomon looked at it. <clears throat> so, any thoughts on those first uh, two sections there? I'll just break up before I look into some verses that I have here. Yeah. What did you do with not saying how the parents all the stuff that you know it has no eternal value and if you wait as you can prevent it, you forget. Yeah. yeah. They're written about, so sometimes we read about them, but basically it's not something we think about. But if we can keep our mind on Jesus and on, on God, and uh, those things have eternal value and the soul of man, what will you take with you to heaven? There's only one thing you can take to heaven, the soul of man. Nothing else. And I'm pretty convinced, and you can think about this. I'm not going to make it a blanket statement, but I'm pretty convinced your earthly mentality and head knowledge will probably be made new too. And I think it is. And we like to think that all our head knowledge, we're going, what value is that going to do up there in heaven when it's going to be about praising Jesus? So, we, we, he didn't get into the wealth part, but uh, the wealth part of, of why I go to work. New Testament gives us all kinds. I'm just going to touch on that a little bit. He's talking more about his head knowledge and his wisdom that he has, but later on he talks about his wealth and how I even mentioned about his accumulation of things. And, and he talked about, you know, didn't bring purpose to him either. And, uh, but the Christian talks about we work with our hands so we can have to give those our need. So there's purpose for a Christian person to work and labor. And here he's saying all these labors under the sun, what, what did it profit us? So I'd like to read later on 
what he says in chapter 3. Like I said, there's a big jump between Ecclesiastes chapter 1 here and chapter 5 that we'll see next Sunday. <clears throat> here it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, after the whole verses before, verse 9, after that, it, it talks about a time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that. And he, he contrasts a time to kill, time to, and everything, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, and all those different things. And then he goes on and says this in verse 9. What profit has he that worketh in, in that wherein he, is, he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God has given to the sons of man to be exercised in it. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor, it is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, for anything taken from it, or anything taken from it, and God doeth it, that man should fear before him. So later on, he comes and figures it out a little bit, you know. Um, that whole labor thing, um, enjoy it. Do it for the Lord. He has a purpose in it for you. Every day, as men, as we go to work, we can get the blues of it. And, you know, but we're supposed to enjoy. He says, it's a gift of God that you can work. So don't take this and say, yeah, well, here I go to work. It's another Monday morning. Tomorrow morning, oh, my. <laughs> well, I have to, to pay my bills. <laughs> uh, that's not what, that's vanity. That's the wrong view of looking at it. And uh, <clears throat> so... He later on figured it out that all this stuff is not if it's done for God. And then also, this is going to be in the third or third lesson, which I'm teaching, so I'm going to take away from it. I won't take away from the teacher, but he says here in, in uh, chapter 12, <clears throat> the conclusion of the whole matter. <clears throat> Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. That's what he says later on. That's the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's in chapter 12, verse 13. And so Solomon did figure it out after he had all this vanity. Uh, but right at the beginning, what a life. But you know, I said at the beginning, how do you look at things? Are we a little bit in this, just a teeny bit? If you are, get your mind on Jesus. Get your mind on eternal things. Take it off the things under the sun. Go beyond the sun to heaven. Find joy and purpose in your labor, realizing you're doing it for Jesus, realizing you're doing it so you have extra like the New Testament teaches, so you can bless others. That's what the New Testament teaches. And if you have had knowledge and wisdom, make sure it's worthwhile. Not that you could tell me a bunch of mumble jumble about stuff, you know. That, and I hear that sometimes. I'm thinking, why does that person feel so proud of himself that he knows all that? After I left, it was just a bunch of mumble jumble. But he had a lot of head knowledge. But it really didn't do a lot of good for me. Find wisdom in things that are of value and purpose and that actually can help human, humankind. I think sometimes we have a lot of head knowledge and things that really are vanity. <clears throat> Any other thoughts before we get to the last part here? Like you said, it's an atheistic view. But sometimes Christians forget. 
and we fall in that too sometimes. And uh, that's what my whole thing is. Am I going to just look at it and say, wow, what a man? Or am I going to say, I should sometimes get to that if I get my focus off the right things. And if I just think, <laughs> and as we look at working and laboring, we, 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 I've heard it said by many people that young people are trying to be where their parents are at right after they get married, going deep in debt, and, and, and then they're frustrated and they can't hardly pay their bills, and then what happens is depression comes. Is that our goal? You know, in some more conservative groups, that's the thing. Just get a farm, start your business, and get ahead, and that shows you're a spiritual person. Is it in the Bible there? Do you find that anywhere in the Bible? Wealth does not make a person spiritual. You can be a spiritual, wealthy person. You can be a spiritual, poor person. Being poor does not make a person, hardly have nothing, living in poverty does not make you a spiritual person. On the other contrast. But we see the tendency in our area is each generation should get further ahead, and then we're really serving the Lord. Read that out of here. You won't be able to. Is it wrong to be blessed by God? And get ahead? Absolutely not. We see a man of Job did that. We see Abraham had many flocks, and men of God were used that. What I'm saying is this a thought process, and that's what I was saying from the beginning. As we're going to get into that way of life in Jesus after we get through the books of Ecclesiastes and Solomon, the way of life, and then later on what New Testament teaches us on that way of life, which is non-resistance, it's a whole lot more of not going to war. It's a whole lot. It takes about getting my mind off the material things and the earthly things and keep it on the heavenly things. And then we don't have to get frustrated when somebody takes something from us because we realize it's of God. He blessed me with it. And it wasn't my personal pursuit that I was trying to get ahead, and when I lost it, no. It was God. He had a right to take it from me. <clears throat> so I, the preacher, the king over Israel and Jerusalem, I gave my heart to seek and search out wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. And it, this sorcerer hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised by their bit. This sorcerer. But then later on he says, if you do it for God, you can find purpose. So this was a man that was just had his focus wrong on stuff under the sun. So don't be part of this sorcerer tomorrow morning. Another whole week before the weekend. Here I go to work. What I said, I mean, I've probably said it jokingly already, you know. Uh, but if that is seriously how we feel, it's a sad state. And, you know, I don't appreciate everything about my work environment all the time. But again, it's a way of life and it's a thought process. I can go there and hate it and complain all the time, or I can be a joyful person to work with and do my part to make it better. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Vexation, the state of being annoyed, frustrated, worried. Is that the state we're in? Annoyed, frustrated, and worried because we have one man that should have got elected and another man did, and now we have to be frustrated about it. Why is that talked about here amongst us? It's okay for non-Christian people with a non-eternal perspective, but why do we think that one man could have made it better? Because we have our focus under the sun. It's not one man. It is one man that can make it better. But he's not man. He's God. That was man for a while here on earth. Now he's back up there as part of the Godhead, waiting, interceding for you and me. That's the man that's going to make it better. And when you have that focus daily on earth, you can go with, it's Jesus Christ that cleansed my heart and made me whole. Jesus Christ will let the hallelujahs roll. And you can sing that, and you can go into work tomorrow morning and say, I have a purpose to show other people to this Jesus Christ. And when they look, they can say, he has the same problems at this workplace as I do, but he has a whole different perspective. So the whole thing was the focus problem. 
Because later on, Solomon does tell us, hey, I, I, change, I see what this is the best way. And we're going to study about that next Sunday, uh, a way of life. And then later on, we're going to get the New Testament, and it's going to explain more than just what this uh, so Solomon in literature does. It's going to talk about eternal kingdom perspective where we're part, us as Gentiles can be part of this heavenly kingdom, not just Jews. And we can have Jesus as our Savior and Lord, and we can take our mind off of material possessions and our great accomplishments and the society, materialistic, self-centered society, and we can look at it as from humble. We first heard lessons about humility and uh, spirit-filled living. And it makes all the difference. Any other thoughts before second brother rings here? <clears throat> For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. Head knowledge, I believe, is going to college, wrong. Is getting a master's degree and then going for a doctorate, sin? Absolutely not. We don't believe that. Gain, accumulating knowledge. But when you have tried to figure everything out, I think this is what Solomon says. Try, he goes beyond all this knowledge of figuring everything out and seeing how it's just this one cycle and you don't have the purpose of Jesus, it brings sorrow. That's my thought in that where someone else might be able to explain it better, but I don't know. Marvin asked for an explanation in verse 18. Anybody else have a good explanation? I think the more you focus on the stuff you originally get the knowledge, the more grief and sorrow you're going to have. I think that's the problem. It's very, very clear on that. <clears throat> well, I, uh, you know, I have a friend that's studying to be a doctor in psychology. And become a psychiatrist, uh, an Anabaptist psychiatrist. And that's his goal. And again, what we talked about, that God-shaped void, if you have humanistic psychology that can figure out everything, how man functions and why they're becoming dysfunctional and they don't go to work because they're depressed and they come to work but they're not good employees because they're just really not, don't have their life together. And then they get involved in substance abuse because they're trying to fill that void. And they can be the most intelligent, smart people. It comes down to where you need to bring spiritual side into it. And I think that's what it's talking about. All this earthly wisdom, as Ivan mentioned, all this earthly wisdom just brings sorrow with it. It's because you just, you can have all that head knowledge and you can be a psychologist and figure out how human minds work and be able to give them the right things and tools to be able to function in this world down below, but there would be no joy and satisfaction and meaning. And it'll just be a sorrowful way of life. Every Monday morning, I know what I have to do. I have to think positive thoughts. That's what my psychologist told me. I have to do this, I have to do What about the Holy Spirit and filling them and molding them and bringing that fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness? What about that? Isn't that better than a psychologist having to give them those tools, those humanistic tools to function? And that's what I'm saying. I'm talking about the non-psychology teaching. But too many times you put the emphasis on that without Christ, and then there's still a void. I Not again. They did. Yep. Yeah. So, brothers and sisters, if you need help, find Christian people. If you're living, and this spoke to you, that you're having a life of vexation of spirit, find Christian people to give you guidance because you need that spiritual input in your life, not just the psychology. That's where he was, and he had a lot of head knowledge and had it figured out, but he was just very vexed. In them. God bless each one of you this week.
coins making diamonds. Oh, the joy of the Lord, it will be my strength. When the pressure is on, he's making diamonds. He's making diamonds, diamonds. And he has rise up from the dust. He is refining and it is timing. He's making diamonds out of dust. He's making diamonds out of dust. He's making diamonds out of us. Happy am I. Happy am I. Jesus is mine forever. Never to be. Always in each and ever. Leading me on. Turn in your church hymnals to song number 489. A charge to keep I have. Number 489. Though me a charge to keep I have a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save, and fitted for the sky, to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill.
please stand for the second song. <clears throat> and number 338. Ye are the light of the world. <clears throat> number 338. And please remain standing for a prayer after the song. Do me so do. Ye are the light of the world, driving the darkness away, shedding your beams on the lost, changing their night into day. Then let your light ever shine, showing the right way to go. Dear Lord, we have come to worship you, for you are worthy of our worship. And I pray that as we look into your word, as, as Mike shares with us, that we would just lift your name on high in our hearts, that we would just honor and adore you today. I pray your blessing on Mike as he brings the word. May um, we just give him peace and, and calmness about sharing, and just bless him for it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're glad to have Mike Zimmerman with us. Would you give him your prayerful attention? Well, good morning, everyone. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I pray that the Holy Spirit could work in me this morning. Uh, sometimes I feel a bit inadequate teaching, preaching, but um, I want to look into God's Word this morning. So the title of my sermon this morning is Resting Christ. Sometimes when I have ideas on sermons, I write them down. Um, I have a little document on my computer. I'll just type them in. And I had a list of maybe, I don't know, 15 ideas and topics. And earlier this week, I was kind of going down through one by one. I was like, nope, never, nope, not happening. Just kind of went down through. I wasn't feeling it for any of them. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And uh, I believe it was Friday morning this week. I had woke up. It was just heavy. I'm like, what am I going to do? So I prayed to God that he would somehow reveal something through his Holy Spirit, reveal it to me what he wants me to share. And he did. The whole idea of rest is something that I want to talk about this morning. So we've all rested last night, I hope. Uh, there's different types of rest. Sleeping is a type of rest. Uh, and we do a lot of it. It's estimated that human beings sleep one-third of their life. So I, we talk a lot about things we do in, our, in the daytime and how to be a disciplined person, et cetera, but not, not a lot of preaching on sleep and rest. So assuming you live to be 80 years old, you're going to spend about 27 years of your life sleeping. That's a long time. 
So that's physical rest. Physical rest can also be relaxing in a soft chair. That would be a type of physical rest. There's different types of rest. Mental rest. So if you're uh, engaging in a very mentally draining activity and you take a break, you withdraw, that's a type of rest. Another type of uh, mental rest, maybe you're in a, an environment of high stress and high tension. You just get away from it. So you can have rest. Sensory rest. So um, all our senses are constantly receiving signals and information. Um, sometimes it's nice to just move to a quiet place, away from the bright lights, the noise, and the commotion. So that's a type of rest, sensory rest. Uh, creative rest. Sometimes people enjoy putting themselves in an environment where they can observe natural beauty or art. Maybe you hike to the top of a mountain and you just sit there a while looking at God's creation, just taking it in. Maybe meditating. Uh, creative rest can also be maybe creating art, gardening. Uh, maybe some people love puzzles. Uh, something that you do that just kind of gets you a break from what you normally do. Gets you away from the stress of life. Uh, there's also emotional rest. There is, um, I mean, I've, I've experienced this, and you have too probably. If you're with people, and you're just peopled out, you're tired of people. You're tired of trying to please people. You just want to get away from people. So you need emotional rest. So you remove yourself from people so that you can have rest. But also, there's also the opposite can be true as well in more of an, an extroverted state. Some people, maybe their normal life, maybe because of the way their job is or whatever, they're not with people enough. They're not socializing with people. So their rest comes by engaging with people. Maybe... Um, going to a trusted group of friends or a friend and sharing and communicating. So another type of rest is to connect beyond the physical and mental. It's just to have a deep sense of belonging. And, you know, the world would teach you that there's meditation and yoga and all kinds of other types of, of you know, various religions and, and rest, spiritual rest that you can take. But this morning what we want to focus on is what we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ and the rest that he can provide. And the Bible has somewhat to say of this. Uh, in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, this is Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, rest a while, for there were many coming and going. They had no leisure so much as to eat. So Jesus, in his, you know, fully God, fully man, his human part of him grew tired and weary. So they had a huge day preaching and teaching and ministering to people. And Jesus instructed his disciples, saying, come with me. We're going to go to a remote place out in the desert so that we can rest a while. So they were in need of physical rest, mental rest, and emotional rest. They need to get away from people. We also know the account of the Bible, Mark 14, verse 41. So Jesus here is in, an, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's in an extreme state of emotional suffering, realizing that to go through with the Father's will, realizing that in the next 24 hours, the pain that he's going to have to suffer, he was away from his disciples praying uh, for strength, praying that this cup would pass from him. And it has several accounts of him walking back and finding his disciples sleeping. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. It is enough, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So his disciples were tired. They didn't get it. They didn't understand what was happening. Jesus was very stressed out. And he was, rest was not going to come for him. So we talk about taking rest, taking a break physically, uh, emotionally, spiritually. Uh, all our bodies need rest. S um, sometimes our bodies reach a point where we just can't do more. It's better just to go to bed. There's that term that says sleep on it. And that does work. I've had some complex situations in my life where I didn't know how to fix it or what decisions to make. Slept on it, full night of rest, woke up and had some clarity in the morning.
So the um, most doctors recommend a certain amount of sleep for the human. Obviously, infants sleep a lot more, 12 to 16 hours. So if you have a young baby, they just seem to sleep all the time. But as they get older, one to two years old, 11 to 14 hours, and that's usually a full night of rest and then a, and a nap time as well. Okay, this is in a 24-hour period. Uh, three to five years old, 10 to 13 hours of rest per 24 hours is recommended. Six to 12 years old is recommended nine to 12 hours. 13 to 18 years old, eight to 10 hours per 24 hour. And adults is seven to nine. So the importance of children getting enough sleep, this is from mayoclinic.com. For children, getting the recommended amount of sleep on a regular basis is linked with better health, including improved attention, behavior, learning, memory, the ability to control emotions, quality of life, and mental and physical health. That's why often when you go to uh, parent-teacher meetings, they're like, you know, try to get your children to bed on time. It's important to have that schedule that they get enough of rest. The importance of adults getting enough of sleep. For adults, getting less than seven hours of sleep at night on a regular basis has been linked with poor health, including weight gain, having a body mass index of 30 or higher, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, depression, and even other sources of, say, Alzheimer's. According to some of the studies, uh, when doctors ask people, you know, how much, how much rest are you getting? What's your average rest you're getting per night? Um, and the data they collected and connected that with certain medical conditions. So human body needs to rest. If you don't rest, you're going to suffer physically and mentally. Um, so I'm talking a lot about sleep and science, you know, but we'll get to some Bible stuff here shortly. So the importance of getting quality sleep. Here's some tips that are recommended by doctors. Quality is just as important as quantity. So yeah, you can be in your bed for eight hours, but if it's not quality sleep, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not beneficial to you in the way it should be. Um, many people who have studied sleep disorders recommend having a set bedtime. Humans function well on having a fixed schedule where there's a certain time you go to bed. Uh, it's also recommended not to have screen time in the last hour before bedtime, phones, computers, etc. Avoid caffeinated products and stimulants several hours before bedtime. Avoid bright lights during the last hour before bed. Do, re do a relaxing activity like reading or listen to soft music before you go to bed. That will help you a lot. Uh, and also, they recommend avoid eating before bedtime. Why? Because your metabolism slows down to about 10% of what it normally is. So your metabolism is what takes all, those, all that energy from the food and processes it. So as your metabolism is reduced and your stomach's full of food, it will result in weight gain. It's, you'd think it wouldn't be that way, but that's the way it works. Um, our bodies are actually designed by God for a natural sleep-wake cycle. There's this thing they call the circadian rhythm. I don't know if anybody ever heard of that. Sounds a little new agey, I know, but it's true. Nature, animals, and even humans are in sync with the day and night cycles. So when it's dark, we're expected to sleep. Um, Experts who have studied these sleep cycles have stated the best restorative and beneficial rest occurs between 10 and 12 p.m. So early rest before midnight is the most beneficial. So if you're going to bed at 12, you're missing out on some of the best rest there is. So being, the short thing is being in night aisle and depriving yourself of sleep can shorten your life and also create physical and mental problems in your life. So there's a, an interesting thing in our modern society. There's some problems that are coming up. And Forbes.com had an article in 2013, and there was people concerned because the, the average American is sleeping 6.8 hours per night, um, and 40% of that group is sleeping less than six hours. So our nation has not always been sleep deprived. There are studies that show in like the year 1910, people were sleeping like nine hours per night on the average. 
Our culture of sleeplessness has been propelled by technologies like artificial lighting, television, and internet, which gives us more opportunities to stay awake in an increasingly 24-7 world. So all the bright lights, all the stuff, all the internet devices is what enables us to stay awake longer than we should. Um, if you go to a doctor and you have a medical condition, they'll often ask you, well, how much rest are you getting? Uh, because that's often closely tied into physical and mental disorders. And what's kind of interesting about our society, and, and doctors are sounding the alarm about this, is the young culture, maybe probably even adults too, are using medication, uppers and downers they call them, to when they want to sleep, they want to sleep now, and when they want to wake up, they want a stimulant. So there's over-the-counter meds you can get, there's prescription meds, but in an increasingly drugged out world where people are using stimulants and depressants to um, force the sleep and wake cycles. Not a natural thing at all. So you think of hunger and eating. When you're hungry, it's a deep desire inside your body to eat food. It's, it's, you can push it off, you can fast, you can go for a while, but it's just a very intense desire inside your body. And the same thing is true with being sleepy. When it's time for your body to sleep, you will naturally start feeling very tired. It just comes on you. I know in the evening, if I sit on a soft chair and read a book, uh, sometimes I, I don't know what happens. I, my wife's trying to wake me up, and I, I obviously I fell asleep while reading. So it can come on very suddenly. And so suddenly, in fact, um, falling asleep while driving is a, a pretty common thing. Um, I did it once. I never crashed. I had a I just kind of had a short burst of micro sleep while I was driving, just, and, I, and I woke up, and my vehicle wasn't where it was supposed to be, and it scared me really bad. And I was awake then. I was, I was fine. Um, it really wakes you up. But when it's time to sleep, your body really desires it. It really de desires physical rest, and it'll just start shutting down when it thinks it's time to sleep. It's a strong feeling the feeling of sleepiness, and it sometimes is impossible to stop. So you might say, well, how long can a human survive without sleeping? This is interesting. Now, I've been awake, as long as I've been awake, it's probably a little bit over 24 hours. And at that point, I'm feeling really tired and irritable and I have brain fog and I'm having problems. But there was an experiment by this high school student named Randy Gardner in 1963. He went 11 days without sleeping. I don't know how that's possible, but it's all documented. He had people with him the whole time to witness everything. Somehow they kept him awake. I don't know if they gave him any stimulants or drugs, but 11 days, I didn't know that was physically possible. Please don't try it. Because sleep deprivation actually can be fatal. There's people that suffer from insomnia. They have certain medical conditions, and they have trouble sleeping. And they can go several days, and all of a sudden they die. Their organs just shut down. Inter interestingly enough, um, if you remember during the George W. Bush administration, all the things that came to light with the CIA enhanced interrogation techniques known as waterboarding, you, you remember that in the news? Another one of the things they use is sleep deprivation as a form of torture in order to extract information from uh, a detainee or a prisoner. And they had information there that they were legally allowed to do it for three days. So in some situations, they were making people stand on concrete naked for three days and weren't allowing them to sleep. I can't imagine how that would feel. After about 24 hours, you would feel just crazy amount of pain coming up, you know, standing on bare concrete. It's just, it's a very horrible situation. After 24 hours of no rest, brain fog will usually set in. You aren't able to think as clearly. Things start to slow down. After 48 hours, for most people, they start hallucinating. They start seeing things and hearing things that aren't really there. So humans need to sleep. We can't just go without rest. So the benefits of a full night's sleep, during sleep, our body begins to repair itself. Your body will go through four different stages of sleep. I can't name them all, but I know like the deepest one is what they call REM sleep. It's called rapid eye movement because during that deepest sleep, your eyes tend to kind of flutter. Uh, if you ever watch someone sleep, like a young child, you can sometimes see their eyes, uh, even though their eyelids are closed, you see their eyes fluttering. And during REM sleep is where dreams occur and, 
And um, it's also where a lot of your muscles are paralyzed. You're just laying there in the deepest sleep possible. So as you slept last night, most likely your body went through several cycles of sleep where you went from stage one, two, three, and then four, REM sleep, and then it came back again. So if you ever notice that throughout the night, you'll sometimes wake up or become more aware of what time it is or, or what's going on, and then again, you'll, you'll go into a deep cycle of sleep. While you sleep, the body repairs tissues, bones, and muscle. The body's immune system regenerates itself to better fight disease. Your body regulates hormones and produces hormones. Your brain goes through a process of consolidation and reorganization. Uh, that's somewhat, they, they don't know all this. They, they just kind of speculate on what some of this is as far as dreaming. But when you're in a dream state, your body is reorganizing. Your brain is reorganizing itself, kind of like a Windows PC where you defragment the hard drive. It's putting everything in its proper place. It's processing all the things you've seen in the last 24 hours and storing them in special locations so that they can be re recalled later. A good night's rest frees us from our current problems and allows the body to escape stress and tension. Uh, it's, it's just great. I enjoy sleeping. Sometimes it's just after a hard day, it's just nice to be able to know you can escape your problems for a little while while resting. And you know what? Sleep doesn't always come for all people. Maybe some of you suffer with insomnia. I ha rarely have I suffered with from insomnia. I sleep. I can fall asleep very quickly. Um, there have been a few nights on, when I was under heavy stress or had something really heavy on my mind that I couldn't sleep. And you see, you know, one, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and those nights of just tension and sweat, it's just not a fun night to be. You desire sleep, but it doesn't come. So I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that. I have a few times. It rarely happens. Most time, I can just, I can sleep, no problem. What is interesting uh, in the Bible, in Genesis 2, verse 21, it says, And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. So he, Adam was totally zonked out. He was in a stage of REM sleep. He was under some type of anesthesia where God went in and performed that operation. He removed that rib. So that's a very interesting thing. I was amazed how much the Bible says about rest and how much the Bible says about sleep. So sleep is a type of rest. Um, so you might say, well, what's the point of talking about all this? Well, we're talking about physical rest. I will be talking about spiritual rest in Christ in a few minutes. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it speaks of our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, being the temple of God. So we talk a lot about taking care of that temple and making sure we don't defile it or trash it, but to keep it maintained. So would not getting a good night's rest be also, you know, getting quantity and quality rest be part of maintaining that temple? I think it would. Genesis 2, chapter, verse 2. On the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that end he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. So right from the beginning in the Bible, we read that God worked for six days during creation, and then he rested on the seventh day. Uh, during the time of Moses, God ordained the Sabbath for rest. Uh, in the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and in it thou shalt do, not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy mainservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For six days the Lord made the heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So part of the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment, God is telling the Israelites, this is for you. This is a commandment for you as a people to rest on the seventh day. Why is that? So you can remember the creation 
And remember that in six days, I created the earth, and on the seventh day, I rested. You can read later on, I don't know if it was in Deuteronomy, but it, it's somewhat, God gave another ordinance for Sabbath keeping. He says, also, the keeping of the Sabbath day is not only to remember creation and the seventh day that God rested, but it's also to remember you coming out of Egypt. In Mark chapter 2, 27 through 28, this is where Jesus is getting into that debate on the Sabbath day. Uh, Jesus never violated the Mosaic law, but he did violate the commandments of man the traditions of the elders, the pharisaical laws. Uh, the Pharisees caught him plucking corn or picking corn on a Sunday, or sorry, a Sabbath day, and eating it. And they challenged him on this. And on verse 27, it says in Mark 2, and he says, And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So it's telling, he's telling these people that the Sabbath, that day of rest, is made for mankind. Now, I might say, well, what, are, what, what about, do we keep the Sabbath? Do, are we Sabbath keepers? This is a, a little bit of a complex and tricky subject among Christians. So here's a few points. I don't want to get hung up on this all morning. I'm just mentioning it. I'll move on. Maybe someday I'll have to do a sermon on this. But there are various Christian views on Sabbath keeping. The New Testament doesn't speak much of it. Um, it appears that the early church, under apostolic leadership, Acts chapter 15, you can read this, that the Gentiles were not required to keep the Sabbath. They were given some laws to keep, but not the Sabbath day. And there's other verses that um, you can use to make that case in the New Testament. So I put Christians kind of in three groups. And I have respect for, for anybody in any of these groups. Uh, but there are some Sabbath-keeping Christians that believe that we should keep the Sabbath day as is described in the Old Testament which would mean at dusk on Friday night, the Sabbath begins. That means no bearing of burdens, no lighting of fires. Um, it's, it's a very strict Sabbath. They wouldn't even travel, some of these people. Um, and these types of Christians tend to believe the Catholic Church was the one who changed from a Saturday Sabbath to a Sunday Lord's Day. And then there's another group of Christians, group number two, that holds the Lord's Day. That's who we are. Um, we would... Um, they, would observe, they would not observe a rigid Sabbath laws from the Old Testament. They believe it's important to gather on the Lord's Day to come together, which uh, the Lord's Day being Sunday, to remember Christ and the resurrection. They observe the principle of the fourth commandment in working six days and resting the Sabbath. Uh, many of these people believe there's evidence before the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century that Indeed, early church, first century church, did do a Lord's Day uh, Sabbath. And then there's another type of Christians that believes that every day is Sabbath in Christ. And I suppose that could be an acceptable position. Um, there are some verses they use in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, to make their case. Uh, they don't hold any day higher than the rest and believe that Jesus Christ is their Sabbath rest. They meet and fellowship any day they please. Um, so again... The way we practice it here, concerning working six days and resting on the Sabbath, we don't practice the Old Testament Sabbath as is defined in the as is defined in the Mosaic Law. But we do observe the Lord's Day. We keep the Lord's Day by making it a day when we come together to worship the Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, and to remember the resurrection and the work He has done for us. We also make it a day where we cease from our normal work. Now, obviously, there's work that needs to be done. Uh, if you're in any type of uh, uh, health care, elder care, or whatever you work, things have to keep going, okay? You can't abandon people that need care. Uh, there's an interesting resource I found, an article by a man named Glenn Wanger. You can find it on anabaptistresources.org. He wrote an article um, on the Lord's Day versus the Sabbath day. I found it intriguing. I, I read over it. It's very long. I don't have time to share bits of it. Um, so in, in short, the Old Testament Sabbath laws were given to the children of Israel through Moses. And this was very rigid, very strict laws. No bearing of burdens, no lighting of fires. And the punishment was death. So the truth is we can't hold 
the Sabbath law as the children of Israel did because last time I checked, you can't legally stone somebody for violating it. But there's other things in the Bible that talk about rest and Sabbath. Um, in the Old Testament, we read about land Sabbaths. Every seven years, they were supposed to let their, their land sit and just let everything grow up. Um, it had to do with regeneration, apparently, um, as far as the soil, uh, just letting that land grow up on that seventh year. And I'd be interested in hearing your opinion on that. But this is what God had required of his, of his chosen people. And then even on seven times seven, 49, every 49 years, they'd have the year of Jubilee, which was just a releasing of debt. It was a special Sabbath year, uh, a releasing of, of yeah, debt and servants and things like that. Another type of rest it speaks of in the Bible is resting in Christ. Uh, It was interesting. Steve uh, read this this morning in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So in our confession of faith, we have an article that we call the intermediate state. And I found it always to be a very interesting article. Like, why is it in there? But it is, it is interesting. And I'll read it to you. Of the intermediate state, we believe that in the interval between death and the resurrection, the righteous will be with Christ in a state of conscious bliss and comfort, but that the wicked will be in a place of torment in a state of conscious suffering and despair. And then it gives scripture verses to back it up. So when someone dies, we often refer to them as resting or sleeping in the Lord, uh, which is true. Um, We don't believe in soul sleep in that when you die, that there is a time of complete darkness and sleep. Do you ever go to bed when you're really tired and you have no dreams and hours go past and you wake up? I remember having to go through a surgery. It was an eye surgery. I had got a piece of metal in my eye. And uh, they gave me anesthesia, and the nurse said, okay, good night. And I, I seen her stick it in the IV tube and inject the whatever the drug they put in there, and I could feel the warmth just go right through my body. I could feel it tingling, and all of a sudden, that was it. I, there's no way I could resist it. And I, hours, you know, hours later, I wake up, and someone's trying to wake me. This is post-surgery. And I, I don't remember nothing. It was just that blank. So... We don't believe that the body goes, or the soul goes to sleep, that there's nothing. We believe that the soul would go to an intermediate state, some would call it paradise, uh, probably more of a disembodied state, but looking forward to new things, a new heaven, a new earth, and a new body, and the resurrection. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. And at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but he, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now here's the critical verses, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In there, in verse 28 and 29 combined, there is a paradox. Do you know what a paradox is? A paradox is a phrase or a sentence you read that seems to contradict itself. But when studied closely, it actually reveals truth. Did you know the Bible is completely full of paradoxes? 
Um, well, first of all, I'll give you some non-biblical paradoxes. These are not from the Bible. Here's a paradox. If I know one thing, it is to know I know nothing. Okay, that's a paradox. It, it doesn't make sense, but yet it does. Okay. Another example is less is more. Doesn't make sense, but it, there's truth there. Less is more. Uh, another example of a paradox would be if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. It seems to, it doesn't make sense, but yet it does. Okay? The Bible's full of paradoxes. And I'll give you some examples of biblical paradoxes. Exaltation through humility. We see that multiple places in the Bible. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. How does that make sense? Receiving through giving. It's a paradox. Strength through weakness. Second. Uh, Corinthians 12, verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's a paradox. Gaining through losing. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, For all things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Losing yourself and losing all things so that you can gain Christ. How about this one? This is another paradox we find in the Bible. Living through dying. John 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. And you can even think of John 3.16. You know, God sent his son to die for our sins, and, and Christ rose again. So through death there is life. Find, there's other paradoxes. I'm not going to go over them all. I have several written here. Um, but finding through losing. Um, whoever, he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So going back to where we were reading in Matthew chapter 11, the paradox is this. So we're, we are, it says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. We're weary and we're carrying burdens and we're coming to Christ. And he says, I will give you rest. But the paradox is this, take my yoke upon you. So yoke, like you think of an ox yoke that, or, that they would put on um, a horse or an ox, it's, it's an instrument of a burden, okay? It's something you take on. There's some weight you take on. So it's, Christ is saying, take my yoke, take my burden, and in doing so, I will lift you up and your burdens that you already have. Are you weary of life's struggles? Come to Christ and he will give you rest. Do you have a burden that you're bearing today. And it can be all kinds of things. It could be the burden of sin. All kinds of sins. That you have not confessed or released that to Jesus Christ. It could be the burden for someone you love that's not walking with Christ. That's very painful. Come unto me, all ye that labor, all who are weary. Maybe, and I feel this way at times, maybe you're just exhausted in life of all the struggles. Psalms 55 verse 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. So when your spirit is exhausted, when you're bearing the burdens of life, where do you turn to? Do you turn to Jesus Christ? We talked about sleep and insomnia. People that through their habit or maybe a medical condition don't rest. They don't rest the way they need to. There are many people not resting in Christ. They're so caught up in the stimulating things of this world. 
um, they struggle finding rest in Christ. Many people in this world are depriving themselves of rest in Christ. They don't understand why they struggle with anxiety, depression, and fear. Jesus tells us here that he desires to give every one of you rest from your troubles and from your stress and from your anxiety and from your sin and from your flesh. He desires to prepare us in the same way physical sleep repairs us. He wants you to rest in him. He says, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Proverbs 3, verse 24. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Psalm verse four, chapter 4, verse 8. I will both lay me down to sleep, and, that, and for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in, in safety. You know what a blessed feeling is? Falling asleep at night knowing you have a good relationship with God and knowing your sins are forgiven. Or even in death, approaching death with peace, resting in Christ, knowing that things are well. So I, I ask you, do you have that peace this morning? If you could turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. I have a few more scripture verses to read. I found this. I knew it was there, but I didn't know it was there. I, I just found it profound as I was studying this topic of sleep and of rest. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And I saw... Another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having, ever, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment descended up ever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is patience, here is the patience of the saints, that they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So we have a lot of things going on here. Uh, God, often his wrath is depicted as a cup of wine where he pours it out. It's an outpouring of God's wrath. And at the end of time, God will pour his wrath out on all the unbelievers. And you know, when Jesus bore our sins on the cross... He, got, he had to taste of that cup of wrath. He took his sin, he took our sins on him. And he had to taste of that cup because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was asking if there's any way possible for this cup to be, of the wine of the wrath of God to be removed from him. It talks about Babylon. Now, obviously in Revelation, there's a lot of ideas on Babylon and Mark of the Beast and what this is or that is. But Babylon, I believe, is just the wicked earthly system we're in today. And it makes it very clear that those who are, have their allegiance in Babylon will be destroyed. And it talks about, uh, in verse 11 there, and they have no rest day or night. You know, I talked about sleep deprivation as a form of torture. 
Imagine not being able to rest, and you need to rest. And in verse 13, it talks about resting from, our, from their labors. You know, I desire to rest someday, uh, you know, from the trials and the problems of this world. So the question is today, will you believe in Jesus Christ and receive the mark of the Holy Spirit and receive that eternal rest in Jesus Christ? Or do you prefer to put your allegiance in a Babylon, in the Babylonian, Babylonian city, which is this world, and receive that mark of the beast from Satan and have no rest for all eternity? So it's, it's pretty interesting there. I found this profound, Revelation 14. Which do you want? Do you want rest and peace? Or do you want sleep deprivation and torture? Let's stand for prayer. Father, our hearts cry to you. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. We desire to draw close to you, and we desire to learn of you. We are tired and weary. We are bearing burdens. We desire to have rest in Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here who is bearing a heavy burden of sin at the moment, perhaps the sin of bitterness, unforgiveness, lust, envy, pride, selfishness, or idolatry. Please raise your hand for a few seconds. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you could forgive us of our sins and release us of this heavy burden of sin we are bearing. Father, help us to put on the yoke of Jesus Christ and to walk as Jesus walked. Father, we pray that you could give us that rest in Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here this morning who is bearing a burden for a loved one who has walked away from Christ, please raise your hand for a few seconds. Father, I pray for this person who has walked away from you. I pray that you could pour out your grace on them and draw them again to you using whatever means necessary. Father, I give this burden to you. Father, we pray that you could give us that rest in Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here this morning who's just exhausted and weary and tired of life struggles, temptations, trials, and infirmities, raise your hand for a few seconds. Father, we confess that we are weary and tired in this life. We come to you asking that you could give us strength and give us that rest in Jesus Christ. Be with all of us here this morning. We bring all our cares and our burdens to you. Grant us peaceful rest in Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. In the church hymnal, let's sing number 454. <clears throat> In the rifted rock I'm resting. Number 454.
Brasil.